welcome to The Green Building Show, where we investigate green design and building trends throughout Australia. We've heard from the experts, but what about the homeowners? This week I sit down with Bronwyn Gingis. She's the owner of a home which is currently under construction in Sydney's inner west. And she's going to explain to us how the process was, how she coordinated with her builder and her architect, and how she overcame some challenges with council approvals. And later we profile a contemporary restoration to a Queensland workers' cottage after the original building was completely destroyed by flood. I'm here today with Bronwyn Gingas. She's uh, the homeowner of a, of a house which is currently under construction in Sydney's inner west. Thanks for being with us, Bronwyn. That's a pleasure. So here today, Bronwyn, we want to get, we want to hear the, the homeowner's perspective. And obviously, you're in the midst of a, of a major construction. Just tell us what what was the motivation to undergo such a, a, a huge project? Well, having lived in the house for a long time, there was always some fundamental flaws with it. Um, and trying to continue to maintain all of that just became a major issue. So it was easier to start with a clean slate to some extent. What was the scariest part of when you, you know, what was the scariest part of the decision-making process when you decided to, look, we're gonna, we're gonna redo this? Um, the decision-making process actually wasn't that scary. It was a gradual um, process. We, we thought about renovating one bathroom. And from that, consultation it snowballed into if we're going to do that we might as well do if we're going to have a mess let's have a big mess <laughs> and get it all over and done within yep. one go that was the the gist of it really and when you decided to do the renovation i guess what was your first point of call did you jump onto google and, and find a, a good architect or did you know someone i knew somebody fortunately i'd met somebody through a completely different circle and i We'd actually spoken to a couple of architects and not been all that dazzled by what was being put to us. So I sat down, sat down with this other guy that I knew um, and over a period of three to four months, I suppose, a design idea revolved. Right, and so what was it that drew you to one architect and perhaps not, not some others? Was it, was it the communication factor? I think or was that it... was a big part of it. Um, it was somebody who I felt was working with us rather than trying to dictate something to us yep. and who also understood that basically we didn't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't, I think some people begin these projects with a particular vision in mind of what they hope to achieve at the end. We were very much... Graham Tippins, thank you for your time. Thank you. Suggestions, any possibilities. It wasn't something that we had a grand plan that we wanted to implement. Mm -hmm. We needed to be shown what the, the possibilities were and to choose from those. Sure, okay, but did you come to the architect with some prerequisites, like a, a budget, a, a strict budget, and some lifestyle considerations, like a lot more light, more room, etc.? Yeah, like in most houses in the inner west, um, there is that desire to open up the backs of the houses so that you actually have some kind of interface with the outdoor space mm -hmm. um, to let more light in. I needed a new kitchen desperately. Um, so those were the sorts of broad brush stroke requirements that we, we do something like that. But how you configure all of that into an actual design is in the lap of the gods because there are only one of a thousand com you know, combinations yeah. that you could come up with. So lifestyle was mm. a factor in that, um, but it was also just being able to have a better relationship with the block of land, basically. Sure. Okay. So when you when you spoke to the architect, you decided to go with the architect. When did how did the project really get off the ground and start rolling? When did the builder come involved? And right, um, it took probably quite some time as we went through a couple of design changes mm -hmm. because the original estimates for building the first design were terrifying. So <laughs> that all had to be modified. So I guess that probably took about another three to six months. Yeah. Then you have the joy of submitting the plans when you finally reached an agreement on what this is going to look like to the council. And getting council approval is probably one of the trickiest steps in the whole process. Right. Um, what made it so tricky? Okay. There is always the potential for council, I think, to start with no 
and then ask you to explain why they should say yes. Right. It's, that seems to be the approach that's taken. So that was a big factor. One of their main concerns was stormwater drainage. That was a critical issue. And also being in a heritage conservation area, although we're not a heritage property, we had to make sure that we didn't interfere with the heritage character of the, of the neighbourhood. Okay, and how was the, the Council of Peas? Was it something that, did you have to reconfigure the design yeah, at all? we did. Right. We had to do that a couple of times um, before they would actually sign off it. Unusually, we didn't have any neighbourhood objections to the design proposal. We're fortunate in that it's a single level house on quite a large block, mm -hmm. so it doesn't actually impact upon the neighbouring properties particularly. So it was merely a matter of keeping council satisfied okay. that the uh, infrastructure wasn't going to be unduly burdened. Right. Mm. Okay, and so how did, the, how did the project develop once work started to get underway? How did, um, how did you go about choosing a builder? Was that the architect's job? We had experience, you? no, it, it was a sort of combined effort. We'd actually had experience with this builder before on a property that we'd renovated just before we started this one. Mm -hmm. um, we put the plans out to tender, so there were three or four different builders that came in with varying quotes. Um, these guys were particularly keen to get the job so their price was extremely competitive and having had the experience of working with them before which had been you know really peaceful mm. um, and in fact the the combination of that architect those builders and us was working very well so it just seemed like a natural progression to continue on with that oh fantastic and is that is that a usual process to put out a tender for, for a yes. job like that on something like this where the the numbers are quite high yes I would suggest that anybody who didn't do that was being a bit silly. Okay, and were you able to get um, an upfront quote from the architect as well as the builder? Yes. So yes. you knew exactly what you're in for? We knew ballpark, there's no exact in sure, any sure. of this, yeah. Okay, and, I guess, and what was the biggest bottleneck throughout the whole project, do you think? I don't think there really has been a bottleneck, to tell you the truth. I think, uh, again, actually, we had to modify part of the plans as we continued on. Um, because we found that we actually had to demolish something mm -hmm. rather than being able to utilise it. And again, that required further council approval. That was a bit of a hold-up, um, because until we had approval on that particular section, we couldn't do some of the demolition work right. that needed to be done. So that was a bit of a hiccup. But I don't think that there's really been a, a, a bottleneck per se. Okay. I think the scope of the works, as it progressed, has increased and that's partly to do, due to my involvement and going, mm, perhaps not that, maybe this instead. And do you have to allow for that? And that's not the builder's responsibility right. or the architect's, that's purely the owner's. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, that kind of leads into my next question, Bronwyn, because I was curious as to know what um, an owner such as yourself, what kind of involvement you have once the project is underway? Is it something you're monitoring on a day-to-day -day basis with constant communication Absolutely. with the architect and the builder? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're not living on site. Um, I have to say my husband is probably more involved on, on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. than I am. Um, but we live within walking distance of it sure. at the moment, so it's very easy to do that. And sorry to interrupt, why do you think it's so important to be that involved throughout the project? Because if something, if there's a flaw and it progresses, it becomes far more complicated to undo it mm -hmm. the longer you leave it. And that's happened on a couple of minor things where there might have been a miscommunication or a misunderstanding of what was written on the plan or a change in what we actually required. Because sometimes when you see something in the physical, it's very different from what was on the plan. Yep. And you suddenly realize, well, that's not going to work for me. Sure. Not the way I live. Yeah. Okay. And, and do you think, did you need some sort of building expertise or is it, does it merely come down to taste and lifestyle or? I don't think you need any building expertise. I think that's, the, that's where you get guidance from your architect, your builder, and where necessary an engineer to see if what it is that you want is a practically achievable mm -hmm. and structurally achievable and then you weigh up the possible cost ramifications as to whether or not you want to go that extra distance pay those extra dollars or whether maybe you compromise and sometimes right. you just do have to compromise okay 
And what about third party monitors? Did you get people in to, to come and make sure the work that's happening no. is no. up to par? No. Okay. No, I don't feel the need for, for that particularly. Um, and why is that? Because you're so confident with your builder and your architect? Yeah, because we've had experience of both of them before and we've been very happy, very pleased with the work that they've done before. Um, also, you get a feel for the tradesmen that are coming on site as to whether or not they're ta what sort of an approach they're taking to the work. Because it's not just your builder. Mm. I mean, you've got cabinet makers, electricians, plumbers, you know, plasterers, the whole gamut. And I think by having that daily contact as well, they begin to realise that you are involved in this, that you're not remote. Not that they're accountable, but most uh, the ones that we've had all seem to take a particular pride in their work, and that comes across. Right. So the standards have been, I think, very, very good. Okay. So what? I guess what was the scariest or most challenging part that you've encountered throughout this whole project? The decision-making process as you go. Once you've got the, the big plan organised and it actually starts to take shape, it's all those little decisions that have to be made on an almost daily basis. Um, I think if I ever have to choose another tap or tile <laughs> again, I will scream. Um, light fittings are driving me mad at the moment. It's those finishing things that you are constantly having to, to decide. It's the decisions every day and I'm spending every weekend in a lighting shop or a carpet shop or a bathroom <laughs> shop is beginning to be very tired. All right, fantastic. Final question from I guess if you had one core piece of advice that you could offer to people who were, who were planning to go down a similar track, what would, you, what would you say to them? The important thing, I think, is the relationship between you, your builder, and the architect. I think that's absolutely integral to the whole process. If that relationship works, the rest of it should follow through reasonably well, provided, of course, that you're prepared for the financial dramas. But I think having that core team of people is absolutely vital. And I hear so often that when those relationships break down, the whole project can turn into a nightmare. And I have to say, I've been very blessed not to have had that experience. Bronwyn Gingis, thank you for your time. That's a pleasure. Well, I'm here today with Graham Tippins. He's an associate architect at Red Dog, Red Dog Architects in Brisbane. Thanks for being with us, Graham. No worries, thank you. Fantastic. We're talking today about the NA House, which is a you know it's a really contemporary restoration to a home that was completely completely devastated in the 2011 Queen, um, Queensland floods. So tell us, Graham. Obviously, the owners were looking to looking for more than just a simple raise and rest. Um, raise and restore approach so what, what do you think was the brief or what was the brief from the from the client for for the new for the new works uh, uh the, the brief was pretty um it was a pretty simple brief to start off with it was just for a three bedroom house and obviously to extend the um the house after the flood so they initially they went through a few different phases of talking to builders and other people before they came to us because they got very confused in terms of what they could do and um i think the the hardest thing with the flood house is how you treat the downstairs space which could potentially get flooded again so this this project had a design solution which raised the house up but we're mindful by raising it up so high it wouldn't have a relationship to the ground floor plane and the, and the landscape and the court in the outdoor areas so we actually created a flood resilient um, utility room or family room on the ground floor which also relates to a external terrace space all right fantastic and in the description that I've read, it said, basically it says, this home represents a clear departure from the original mild-mannered workers' cottage. So can you elaborate a little bit on this departure? Well, the, we've kept the core of the existing house, which still has the, um, you know, the weatherboards, but the rear extension and the undercroft extension changes and inverts the, the normal typology of the introverted you know, workers' cottage house. So the undercroft is, um, you know, face, just raw face block work with polished concrete floors, and it opens up and engages directly with the backyard and the landscape and also the, the street, because it's like a two-street frontage. And the upper level where the rear extension is, where the, you know, the existing house has um, got small windows and is quite reserved, the master bedroom back pod inverts that and opens up the windows and, and is, you know, quite contemporary in nature when you get into the backyard. Fantastic. And you use uh, a number of lightweight materials in the, in the restoration. Was was cost a factor in, in the in the materials decision, or was it um, was logistic logistical reasons? 
Uh, cost was a massive factor because they had a uh, you know very tight budget for what they needed to achieve, and they only had a certain payout from the insurance company. So cost was definitely uh, an issue, but also a resilient finish as well. That's not going to have too much maintenance issues um, in the future. So the back extension, the back rear extensions, is um, just FC six mil FC with cover battens, and then the front where we had to rip off all the existing weatherboards that have been replaced with you know fibre cement weatherboards. So um, created a cost effective solution but also hopefully not too many maintenance issues in the future for them as well. Graham Tippins, thank you for your time. Thank you.